Level 9, frequency response. Digital audio has a frequency response that's flatter than a ruler, all the way from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Analog tape, not so much. OK, so analog tape can cover the whole range and can in fact extend up to the high 20s of kilohertz. But in between, the response is far from flat. In the bass end, we have woodles. Yes, woodles. That's where the response goes up and down, and it's worse at higher tape speeds. So at the normal 15 inches per second, in reality, the woodles would be hardly noticeable. At 30 inches per second, which I'm going to say I could never possibly have afforded at around 15 minutes per reel, people were starting to complain. And at mid and high frequencies, the response still wasn't flat. If it varied less than two decibels up and down across the range, then you were doing well. Once again, in reality, it didn't make that much difference. It never stopped anyone making music, but I prefer flat. Level 10, gap scatter. OK, so I've mentioned that the tape heads need to be set precisely in terms of height, rap, zenith and azimuth, mostly azimuth. What if I told you that the individual track elements of a multi-track head could vary due to inaccuracies in the manufacturing process? So you can't set the azimuth correctly for every track. It's going to be a compromise, where as many tracks as possible are as little out of alignment as possible. Frustrating. Level 11. Guard bands. In a stereo tape recorder, there are guard bands that are not recorded at the edges of the tape. This is so that any edge damage doesn't cause dropouts. Fine. There's also a guard band between the two tracks to minimise crosstalk, or shall I say reduce it to an acceptable level. But I said, stereo recorder. What about a two-track recorder? Are they the same thing? Well, yes, you can record stereo on both, but a two-track recorder has a wider guard band to reduce the crosstalk further. So you could use the two tracks for completely different purposes. The difference is in the tape heads. Everything else can be the same. You can play a tape recorded on either type of machine, on either type of machine. But the problem is that a two-track recorder will intrinsically have a lower signal-to-noise ratio because of the wider guard band. And if you play a stereo recording made on a two-track machine on a genuine stereo machine, you'll be playing back parts of the guard band, adding to the noise. It's all part of the fun of analog tape. <laughs> Level 12, low frequency spread. On analog tape, low frequencies spread out on playback. It's crosstalk but a special kind of crosstalk. In most analog electronics, crosstalk is mostly heard in the high frequencies. But in tape playback, it's also in the low frequencies. And they can spread out a lot. Here's a situation. You have a MIDI sequencer and you're synchronising it to your multi-track recorder. This was a common way of working before digital audio workstations became capable of handling an entire multi-track session themselves. You do this with SMPT timecode. SMPTE for the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers. This traditionally goes on the highest numbered track. It needs to go on an edge track because of crosstalk, and an edge track has only one adjacent track to crosstalk into. That's fine. It goes on track 24 of a fully pro recorder, or track 16 of a Fostex E16 that you would find in a demo studio or a well set up home studio, like mine back in the 1980s. So then you fill up the tracks. For some reason, you've left the bass till last, and it has to go on track 15, because that's the only track left on your Fostex. Poor planning. The bass will spread into the timecode track, and it will mess up your SMPTE. Your MIDI sequencer will grind to a shuddering halt. Actually, it'll just stop, or not even start. The solution is better planning, and possibly leave track 15 blank, or record something high frequency, like, um, finger symbols, or record at a low level. Better planning is the way to go, as in many things in life.